We are about to explore more truth on this wonderful day that the Most High has made. We are going to explore more, more truth. How exciting it is, okay? Especially when you are a truth seeker, okay? A lot of people, they eat healthy. And they are curious to know where their food comes from. They want to know what farm, okay? They want to know if it's vegetables, okay? If it was in a place where pesticides were used. But a lot of us today, we're not curious of where our food comes from. We're not curious into knowing where our Bible translations all originated, okay? We know they all came from manuscripts, and we're going to go into a famous manuscript today. However, we're going to finish off where we left off at yesterday. And I want someone to get 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 18. Because this is going to give us the summary of what happened. David originally wanted to send kindness, so he sent comforters. And his comforters were put to shame. They were disrespected, so they disrespected David himself. So in other words, all hell broke loose. All hell broke loose, and now we're going to catch back up. Let's get that. This is the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 10, verse 18. And the Syrians fled before Israel, and David slew the men of seven hundred chariots of the Syrians, and forty thousand horsemen, and smote Shobach, the captain of their host, who died there. Forty thousand horsemen, okay, seven hundred chariots, all got killed for nothing, okay, all because the princes of Ammon twisted the truth. They lied, they gossiped, and they was the cause of a lot of bloodshed. Just like today, okay? We're going to get into that. But I want you to read 1 Chronicles 19, 18, okay? Because this is the same story. However, the book of Chronicles have different details let's get that this is the book of first chronicles chapter 19 verse 18 but the syrians fled before israel and david slew of the syrians seven thousand men which fought in chariots and forty thousand footmen and killed shofak the captain of the host all right so now if you look at second samuel chapter 10 18 on the screen and you look at first chronicles 19 18 on the screen what's wrong with that somebody tell me what's wrong the numbers. The numbers. The numbers. <laughs> the numbers are wrong. Now, a lot of Israelite camps, they don't think numbers are important. A lot of Christians don't think numbers are important. But numbers are very important. So 2 Samuel 10, 18 says 40,000 horsemen were killed. However, Chronicles says 40,000 footmen. That's a big difference. Footmen and horsemen are two different things. Two different. Not only that, 2 Samuel 10, 18 says it was 700 chariots. But the book of Chronicles says it was 7,000 which fought in chariots, okay? Now I'm going to take you to a scripture. This is a famous scripture. This is going to be Numbers 23, 19. Let's get that. This is the book of Numbers, chapter 23, verse 19. God is not a man, that he should lie, neither the son of man, that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, 
And shall he not make it good? So in the book of Numbers, in the book of Numbers, God says he doesn't oh, lie. Whoa. Hey. Now that stuck out to me today as I was studying. Right here in the book of Numbers, God says, I don't lie. So what that means is man in his humanity, okay, he lied. Okay, he made the mistake because God is accurate. When God told Noah to build the ark, everything that he gave in the instructions for Noah was exact. Same thing with the temple. In ordering the temple to be built, everything that God gave was exact. God is the definition of wise. We all get wisdom from him. Okay, even today, numbers are important. Okay, if you put $700 in the bank and you take out 7,000, somebody is going to be in trouble. All right, and it's the same thing with the scripture God is not a man that he should lie. Keep in mind, God is not the son of man either. God is not the son of man. So Jesus is not God. All these things that you see in Numbers chapter 23, 19, lets you know how awesome our God is, that he cannot lie, and that he is not a man, and everything he said, he's going to make it happen. So as we look at the story, we see, that David wanted to send kindness and what happened was his kindness was humiliated and so therefore he avenged his comforters and we don't know the exact number if we go by Samuel it was 700 chariots and 40,000 horsemen and if we was to go on chronicles it was 7,000 which fought and carried and 40,000 footmen. So we don't know the exact number, but we know that God knows all hell broke loose when they disrespected the comforter, which leads us back to our scripture. Let's get that in Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. You're going to see that whatever you say about Jesus, it will be forgiven. But whatever you say about this advocate, about this paraclete, about this messenger, about this comforter, God is going to require it of you. Now, let's get that. This is the book of Matthew, chapter 12, verse 31. Wherefore, I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Neither in the world to come. So whatever you say about the Son of Man, it will be forgiven. Okay? But whatever you say against the Comforter, the Holy Ghost, it will not be forgiven. God is going to hold you accountable. That's how we know Jesus is not the Deuteronomy 18:18 18, 18 prophet because Matthew chapter 12, 31 and 32 precepts with Deuteronomy 18 and 18 going into 19. I want someone to get that. It's on the screen. This is the book of Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 18. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee and will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Keep going. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. I will require it of him. That precepts exactly with Matthew. Okay? Because this is the prophet whom God is going to hold you accountable of. Okay? Whatever you do with whatever he says. Okay? Okay? You're going to be judged just by that. And when we look at Deuteronomy 18, let's look at it. It says, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren. 
Now that word brethren don't mean blood brothers. It doesn't actually mean just your own people. That actually means your fellow countrymen. Okay, because remember, sometimes they will call somebody their brother that wasn't their brother. For instance, Abraham called Lot his brother. Was Lot Abraham's brother? No. He wasn't. He was his nephew. Okay, so even in the Bible, the Bible calls Esau your brother. Now, was Esau a brother to the actual tribes of Israel? No. No, he wasn't. He was only a brother to Jacob, but not the rest of the tribes. But that word brother actually can translate to or be interpreted as your fellow countrymen. And if you are studying the Bible and if you are reading the NSB version of the Bible, it will literally tell you your fellow countrymen. OK, that's the New American Standard translation. But now we want to look more at verse 18 and it says, I will put my words in his mouth. Now, why would you have to put words in the Holy Ghost mouth? Why would you have to put words in the Holy Spirit's mouth? That don't even make sense, okay? He shall speak all that I command him. That is literally saying that this man is going to be a person. He's going to have the ability to speak and he's going to have the ability to listen. That's why I don't get when people say, oh, it's the Holy Ghost. And Jesus says he's going to speak all that I command. Why would you have to command the Holy Ghost to say anything if it's a ghost, if it's a spirit of God? It knows exactly what to say. You don't have to tell it to say anything. And another thing, it says whatsoever he hears from God, that will he speak. Why would the Holy Ghost have to hear? Okay, those are all functions that humans have. We have those capabilities. So as we continue to look at verse 18, we see that he's going to speak all that God commands him. And in verse 19, it says, it's going to come to pass that whoever doesn't listen to the words which he, speaking of a he, shall speak in my name, I will require it of him so now we want to get back to where we was at we talked about Shobak being destroyed and now we want to get that last verse because we didn't get that yesterday that's going to be immediately the next verse after the 40,000 footmen or carriers was destroyed it's going to be 2 Samuel chapter 10 verse 19 this is the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 10, verse 19. And when all the kings that were servants to Hadarezer saw that they were smitten before Israel, they made peace with Israel and served them. So the Syrians feared to help the children of Ammon anymore. The Syrians was like, you know what? I'm not going to help Ammon no more. Here it is. They got all of our men killed for nothing. Okay? It was all out of pride and arrogancy. OK, that all those men were killed. They could not accept the free gift of the Holy Ghost. I'm paraphrasing. But instead, what did they want to do? They wanted to get in the man's business. They wanted to bring up all his sexual reproach. They shaved they dang on service down to the buttocks, shaved off their beer. OK, that is metaphorically speaking of you making a reproach of the messenger. Okay, so now I want to keep going and I want to go on to these manuscripts. Now I'm going to read this. All present day Bibles are compiled from ancient manuscripts. The oldest dating back to the 4th century CE. No two ancient manuscripts are identical. All Bibles today are produced by combining manuscripts with no single definitive reference. The Bible translators attempt to choose the correct version. In other words, since they do not know which ancient manuscript 
is the correct one, they decide for us which version. For a given verse to accept. Take John 14, 26 as an example. John 14, 26 is the only verse of the Bible which associates the Paracletos with the Holy Spirit. But the ancient manuscripts are not in agreement that the Paracletos is the Holy Spirit. I hope y'all caught that. For instance, the famous Codex Syracus, written around the 5th century CE and discovered in 1812 on Mount Sinai, the text of 1426, speaking of John, reads, Paraclete, the Spirit, and not Paraclete, the Holy Spirit. So when we look at John 1426, in ancient manuscripts, it doesn't say Holy Spirit. It calls it the Spirit. Okay? Remember, there's only one scripture in the entire Bible that says the Holy Spirit is the comforter. Okay? And it's this verse right here. But when you actually look in the manuscript where they translated the Bible from, this is how it reads. I'm going to read it for you. But that spirit, the comforter, who my father will send unto you in my name, he shall teach you all things and he shall remind you of all that I have said. Wow, that's deep. It don't say Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit was added and it's only in the Bible one time. Now we're going to look at this same scripture speaking of the comforter and three more chapters in the book of John. All right. Let's read John 14, 26, the way it's in our Bible. It reads, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, we just read from the manuscript and it doesn't say Holy Ghost. It says that spirit. That's a big difference. And you're going to see why that is a big difference. Now, I want someone to read. This is going to be John 14. Verse 16 and 17. This is the book of John, chapter 14, verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Now keep in mind, y'all, it says the Spirit of truth this time. And remember last time it said that spirit. So this time it don't say Holy Ghost. It just says spirit of truth. And you're going to find out what the word spirit actually can mean. But I want to get another scripture. This is going to be the book of John. Chapter 15 verse 26. This is the book of John chapter 15 verse 26. But when the comforter is come... Whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Notice the Comforter is called the Spirit of truth. That's two times. Doesn't say Holy Ghost. Just like the ancient manuscript, it says Spirit. It doesn't say Holy Spirit. And you got to notice, many of the people who wrote these Bibles... They were Christians. So they was already writing from their own beliefs. That's why in the book of 1 John chapter 5, they added the scripture when it talks about three that testify. Speaking of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, that wasn't originally there. They put that there because they believed in the Trinity. Okay? 
which is something that came later after Jesus departed. People started believing in the Trinity. So when they was writing books, writing Bibles, writing commentaries, they added this Trinity thing. Okay, so now we want to read John 16, 13. This is the book of John, chapter 16, verse 13. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. All right, so John 16, we went over yesterday. It has about seven masculine pronouns, okay? There's not one scripture in the Bible that has that many masculine pronouns in the same scripture or feminine. This is going into a man, definitely. It keeps saying he, it keeps saying he, and you notice in this scripture, it doesn't say Holy Ghost. It literally says spirit of truth, which makes three times to one time. Three times it's called the spirit of truth. One time it is called the Holy Ghost. But we looked at the ancient manuscript and it's called spirit. Now let's find out what spirit, what can spirit actually mean? This is going to be 1 John chapter 4 verse 1. This is the book of 1 John chapter 4 verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Okay, so it says, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. And then, instead of saying spirit again, it says prophets. Okay, so this verse could be read like this. Beloved, believe not every prophet, but try the prophets. Whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Every time the word Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit is mentioned, it's not necessarily talking about some invisible ghost. Even the word Spirit doesn't mean Holy Ghost all the time. In the book of Revelations, it says seven spirits are sent out into the earth. Does that mean seven Holy Spirits? No! Okay, so that's why it's very important and imperative that you study line upon line, precept upon precept. So now when we look at that scripture and I'm going to read it, John 16, 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth or the prophet of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself but whatsoever he hear he shall speak and he will show you things to come so notice it uses the word comforter and remember Jesus also said I will pray the father and he will give you another comforter and that word comforter if you really study it, it actually means advocate. And Jesus was an advocate. And Jesus was speaking of another advocate. So when we read John 14, 16, when he says, I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter, he's literally saying he will give you another advocate. An advocate is someone who intercedes, who stands in the gap, okay? It's like a court term, okay? One that's going to plead on your behalf, okay? That's what that's going into. Now I want to get the scripture, which is going to be in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. That way we have everything in scripture, and you see that I'm not making up nothing. Okay, let's get that. This is the book of 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children... These things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. All right, I spent 20 years studying the Bible. I've been in the Christian church. I've been in the Israelite camp. So I owe it to myself to consider all options that are on the table, especially when they are all lying. 
So now I'm going to read something. It literally says, actually, there had been a great controversy regarding the word paraclete, which is parakletos. In the Greek Bible, and that this word was changed from parakletos, and this is P-E-R-I-K-L-Y-T-O-S versus P-A-R-A-K-L-Y-T-O-S, which means the praised one, meaning Ahmed in Arabic, the name Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So the word parakletos, if you slightly spell it, okay, minus a few letters, it actually means the admired one or the praised one, okay? And you got to understand, Jesus wasn't speaking Greek. Jesus was speaking Aramaic. That's another minus against us because we don't even have a Bible in the language that Jesus was talking to us in. So we're already missing out on a few things. So with that in mind, I want to go back to John 16, 13, when it says, how be it when he, the spirit of truth is come or the prophet of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. So when you read the Bible, you'll see that the gospels, they have basic principles. They don't have knowledge concerning all things, okay? That's why we was in need of someone else to give us laws concerning hygiene, concerning lifestyle, concerning laws. We needed someone to give us laws into all truth, okay? Even the basic things. We've lost our heritage. We do not know how Jesus and the disciples and the patriarchs conducted themselves in their day-to-day lives. So now I'm going to read a Surrey, which is 53, 3 and 4, and is speaking of the Gentile messenger, Mohammed, peace and blessings be upon him. It says, nor does he speak from his own inclination or from his own feelings. Now going back to John 16, 13, it says, how be it when he the spirit of truth is come. He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. Now, I've heard a bishop literally said that Jesus is the Holy Ghost. But the Holy Ghost literally right here, Jesus is saying that it doesn't speak of himself. So how could Jesus be the Holy Ghost if the Holy Ghost doesn't speak of himself? That is what you call confusion. I'm going to read that again. How be it when he, the prophet of truth, and they say that's Jesus. When he has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. That don't make sense. This has to be someone else, because when we look at the scripture, John 14, 16, it says, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever now that word another in the Greek actually means another of the same kind another human being not some ghost not some spook okay and that's why you have to study these things for yourself not only that I'm gonna keep going it says he doesn't speak from his own inclination he doesn't speak from his own feelings Describing the comforter in John 16, 13, he doesn't speak from himself, okay? But whatever he hears from God, he will speak, going back to Deuteronomy 18, but the prophet is not going to speak anything from himself. Deuteronomy 18 says, whatsoever he hears from God, is that what he's going to speak, okay? Now, I want to go back. In Surah 53, 4, it says, it is not but a revelation revealed. So when he speaks, it's a revelation revealed. It's from God. It's not from himself. Going to John 15, 27, Jesus said, and ye also shall bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Now that term bear witness Jesus used the term bear witness more than anybody. And I'm going to show y'all something. 
I'm going to show you something. I'm going to type in the word bear witness. Used in Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, okay, 1 Kings, Job, Proverbs. Now look, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Who is using the term bear witness? Jesus. He's using it more than anybody. Jesus is constantly saying bear witness, bear witness, bear witness, bear witness. In John 8, 18, he said, I am the one that bear witness of myself. And the father that sent me bear witness of me. Okay. John 5, 32. There is another that bear witness of me. He said there's somebody else that bears witness. Now, Jesus used the term bear witness more than anybody. Okay. More than anybody. Now, in Islam... Islam is all about bearing witness. That's all they do. I bear witness. I bear witness. I bear witness. Okay. And Muslims bear witness to the oneness of God by reciting the creed. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Peace be upon him. This simple yet profound statement expresses a Muslim's complete acceptance of and total commitment to Islam, which leads me to a lot of different people who do YouTubes. They will tell you after studying the Bible for years, give us a break, y'all. We didn't become Muslims or we wasn't in Islam from day one. We've been in the Christian church. We've been in these camps, okay? We've been studying the Bible, okay? And all we want to know is truth. The most important thing on our list is not to know that Jesus is black. So give us a break. We in this thing to save our souls from hell. That's the most important thing. When I got in the Bible, I was concerned about is my salvation. Not a color, not a creed, not a race. Okay? So when we study the Bible and we are seeing these things, and we hear what people say, and then we see what the Bible say, Especially now that I just brought up bear witness, okay, you have many people doing YouTubes that Jesus was a Muslim, okay? And we know it's true that he didn't practice Christianity. He didn't practice Judaism. If any religion he practiced, it was the religion of Islam, and that's from scholars. If you study it, if you are studying the Bible. Going on, now we are at 1 Samuel. Chapter 25, and it's a lot of reading. I just want to deal with verse 1 right now. Somebody get that. There's a book of 1 Samuel, chapter 25, verse 1. And Samuel died, and all the Israelites were gathered together, and lamented him, and buried him in his house at Ramah. And David arose, and went down to the wilderness of Paran. All right, now what is the wilderness of Paran? Somebody tell me, what is the wilderness of Paran? Mecca. I'll give y'all that. I'll give y'all that. But we need proof. It sounds good. It sounds good, but we need proof, okay? All right, y'all. Y'all knock it off. Knock it off. All right. Somebody read that on the screen and stop at Genesis 2120. Paran is Mecca, not Sinai. And it is where Ishmael, peace be upon him, lived in as mentioned in Genesis. Okay, so Paran is Mecca, okay? You have to study, you have to look at the maps, and let's go to Genesis 21-20 real quick, okay? That way we have scripture. David, after Samuel's death, he went into Paran, okay, because he was hiding from King Saul. King Saul was trying to kill him. Okay? So he found refuge in Paran, which is present day Mecca. Let's get that. This is the book of Genesis, chapter 21, verse 20. And God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. All right. So that wilderness is speaking of Paran. 
okay, which is present day Mecca, okay? So what we're going to do is, because we already hitting time, and we finna be going over this. I just want you to digest verse 1. Samuel died, okay? And all of Israelites were gathered together and lamented him. And he was buried, and David arose and went into the wilderness of Paran. We're going to be picking back up on this. This is very interesting. I encourage you to study the Bible. I encourage you to stop being racist. I encourage you to realize that we are living in a time where God is about to rescue his people. All right. Now it's time for us to get in the word. How many of y'all want to get in God's word? Me. Yeah. All right. 